Well, good morning. How's everyone doing? Great. Well, it's, it's great to see all of you. Uh, happy 2017. I've been telling uh, several of you that that's going to take a little while uh, for me to remember. I think I told someone this morning, happy 2015. So uh, I guess I'm a little behind the times there. Uh, but I hope everyone had a Merry Christmas and, and is looking forward to a, a great 2017. Uh, this past Christmas, Amanda and I, on the latter half of the day, we uh, spent it in a, in a car uh, driving down from Ohio, so 20-plus hour drive uh, with my entire family. And this is the first time that my entire family uh, is all together in Texas. So, so I, guess we've, I guess they finally made it, as, as you guys would probably say. Uh, but we've, we've just had a great time, and uh, as is often the case when families get together, we spent a lot of time this past week uh, just rem reminiscing and talking about different memories from the past. Uh, and one of the memories that we talked about uh, quite often this week was of this house that we used to live in. And I don't know if it was maybe just because our whole family was crammed into one little tiny apartment, and so we were thinking about, you know, more space. Uh, but we were thinking about this house. And let me tell you, let me tell you all about this, this house that we used to live in. It was a really nice house. All right, it had a backyard that we could play in and uh, woods and, and trees that we would climb. And it even had a Bible verse on the cornerstone of the house. All right, so that's how you know it's, it's a nice house, right? <laughs> However, there was one problem with this house, and it was a problem that, that you couldn't see just driving by on the street. You couldn't even tell there was a problem if you were in most of the rooms. And that's because this problem was in the basement. And I know, I know most of the houses down here in Texas don't have basements, but 90% of the houses up north have basements. And so basements, you know, they used to be where people would just store things. Uh, and then as there were advancements in heating and, and interior design, the basements became more livable. And so our basement was just like that. We would hang out down there. My brother and I would play a lot of games down there. Until one day, I went down into the basement, and no one told me that my dad had installed a swimming pool in the basement. But you see, no one told him either, because <laughs> he hadn't. In the far back corner, there was a crack, and there was water that was just pouring and gushing into the basement. And you know, water is not supposed to be inside of the house, unless it's the, I guess, bathtub or sink or something. But it's not supposed to be all over the ground. And so my dad, he's an engineer, and so he, he thought of all these different ways that we could stop this leak. And so uh, one of the things he did was he had this towel system, which I don't even know exactly how it worked, but it worked for a little while, where you take these towels and you clog up the, le uh, the, the leak. And then there was like a secondary line of defense of towels. Uh, and then the water remembered that it was in charge and just took over the basement again a couple months later. Uh, he also tried something where there was a bucket, and he put a bucket under the leak, under the leak and uh, there were some PVC pipes that would come out of the bucket and, and go all the way into a drain. And so he tried all these different solutions, but the water just kept coming right back into the basement. And so finally, I guess my dad, you know, humbled himself and uh, consulted someone else, a, a basement specialist, I guess, whatever that title would be. And so the guy came down, and he, and he was looking at the, the leak and, and all the water that was pouring in, and he said... Uh, you, you don't have a problem with, with a leak in your basement. And so my dad probably looked at the guy and, and looked at the leak that he apparently wasn't having a problem with right there and was wondering why he even consulted this guy. But he said, you don't have a problem just with a leak. Your problem is with the entire foundation. You see, as nice as this house was, there was a problem that if it was just completely left untreated, it would destroy the entire house. People in our society have all kinds of brokenness and, and leaks and cracks in their lives. And if left untreated, it'll just completely ruin them. Today's the first day of the new year, and so I'm sure many of you probably saw a lot of the 2016 year in review videos. Some of them are pretty cool. I don't know. Did anyone see the Google one? One person? Okay. <laughs> Two? It was pretty awesome. If you, if you go back home, look up Google uh, 2016 year interview because it's pretty, it shows what all the top Google searches were. And there's several of them. There's some for sports, uh, some for movies, some for all kinds of things. Well, I just want to give you a few statistics that aren't as, aren't as happy as that Google video uh, from 2016. The nationwide divorce rate in 2016 was between 40 and 50%. The suicide rate in America between 1999 and 2016 rose 24%. One in seven Americans went to bed hungry in 2016. For the first time, drug overdoses actually surpassed car accidents as the leading causes in incidental death, accidental deaths 
in, in, uh, in America. With my home state actually leading it with 3,000 uh, fatal drug overdoses in 2016. And then the last one, 2.1 million, 2.1 million youth went through the juvenile justice system across the country. And so we should see those statistics. When we hear those, that should stir something up inside of us, and we should realize that this is not right. People are broken. And this should lead us to ask several different questions. I know several of us in here have been affected by these statistics directly. And so this should make us ask, one, how do we deal with the brokenness in our own life? But also, how can we as a church help everyone else deal with that brokenness as well? Because if left untreated, it'll just completely ruin them. Jesus, he tells a story at the end of the greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount. And so if you have your Bible open to Matthew chapter 7, that's where we'll be today, Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, uh, then on the way out, see uh, Amanda or whoever's at the information table, and they'll give you a Bible. That's our gift to you this morning, but for now you can just uh, follow along with me on the screen. Uh, but Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 24. And these are the words of Jesus here. He says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house. Yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. So Jesus gives us this story of, of two builders, two men, and two possible different outcomes. And what I want to do this morning is I want to give you two things. I want to talk about the differences between these two builders and the similarities. And I'm going to do it reverse. I'm going to do similarities first. <laughs> so if you're taking notes, those are our two headings this morning, the similarities and the differences between the two buildings, builders. So like I said, Jesus had just finished preaching the greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount. And Amanda and I, actually, when we went to Israel, we were blessed with the opportunity to actually go to the location of the Sermon on the Mount, right next to the Sea of Galilee. And, and if you go there, you can see how someone could stand at the bottom of that little mound and actually just project their voice, and their voice just naturally carries up to the top. The natural acoustics there, I mean, it's the greatest place for the greatest sermon that can ever be preached. And so what's interesting about this sermon here is that Matthew, in his account, uh, he doesn't just give us the contents of the sermon. But he gives us how the crowd reacted to the sermon. The sermon itself is something amazing. I mean, I think most people who aren't even in church for very often, or most people who maybe even never went to church in their life, could at least grab a couple phrases that were included in the Sermon on the Mount, like, love your enemies, or judge not lest you be judged. Those are all things that Jesus talked about in the sermon that stretched all the way from chapter 5 until here at the end of chapter 7. But Matthew just doesn't just give us the contents of the sermon, but he gives us how the crowd reacted to the sermon. And so what he says here in, in, in verse 20, 28 is he said that when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowd were amazed at his teaching. And the reason the crowds were amazed is because Jesus taught a completely different way than the way that the scribes used to preach earlier. So historians tell us that the scribes would just get up there and they'd unravel their scrolls and they'd just read the law and, and all the, the history. And it's, you know, it's all good stuff because it's the word of God. But they would just read it word for word about how long your garments had to be and, and your relationships and uh, just different history. And, and so people over time, they begin to say, you know, quite frankly, this is just a waste of time. People begin to just be bored with hearing the same thing over and over in the way that it was, that it was taught. And, you know, if we're honest with ourselves, this isn't too different from the way that a lot of people see church today, right? I'm sure we have all uh, know people who might not necessarily disagree with everything that's taught on Sunday, but they just kind of see church as a waste of time or maybe uh, a couple hours where you can go and get some extra sleep or something. Uh, someone who was in church, who must have grown up in church and had this mindset that church wasn't the most exciting thing, they wrote this poem uh, that goes like this. They said, The color of my pastor's eyes I cannot quite define. For when he prays, he closes his, and when he preaches... I close mine. 
I'm, I'm sure if we're honest, we, we might have all felt this way in church, at least at one point or another. Uh, I know my mom, when I was growing up, she used to uh, write on a piece of paper, you know, Jesus and God and, and popular church words that were going to be preached in that sermon, and then I'd have to keep tally marks. So that's, that was her way of keeping me attentive to the sermon. And I don't remember which one of my siblings it was, but it must not have worked for all of us because there was one Sunday when we were sitting in church and I know someone's head was nodding back and forth and nodding back and forth and then boom, it just hit the pew right in the very front and everyone looked and I don't know, maybe they were just deep in prayer or something, so I, mean, I shouldn't call them out like that. <laughs> but regardless, I, I can guarantee that no one was falling asleep uh, at the Sermon of the Mountain when Jesus was preaching uh, because like verse 29 tells us, he was preaching uh, like one who had authority not like the teachers of the law. And so he, he ends this great sermon with this illustration that we just read about the wise and the foolish builder. And I'm sure many of us who have grown up in church have heard this story taught. Uh, there's even a song that, that goes with it about the rains coming down and, and the floods coming up. Anyone who, who's heard that song? All right, so a lot of you have heard the song. I'm, I tried to get Will to let us sing it this morning, but he, he didn't want to. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> And so uh, Jesus used this, and, and, and we, learn, we learn about this story in church, but usually we focus so much on the differences between the two builders that I think it's easy to miss the fact that there are some similarities between the builders. So I want to give you three similarities this morning. The first is that both of these men were building a house. Both were building a house. Now, that sounds pretty obvious, because Jesus said they were both building a house, but I think it's pretty un unlikely that Jesus would, you know, go through this whole sermon about life transformation and this different way of preaching and then just end it by saying, oh, and by the way, you know, make sure you build your houses according to a building code of where you are. Right? He had to have some other meaning for what he meant by building a house. And so when the Bible talks about building a house, it, it means several different things. One, to build a house can mean to build a life, to build a life. We're all trying to build some sort of life, right? That's the, that's the reason why if you're in school, you go to school, or if you work, you work, or if you used to work, that's why you did work, so that you could get from point A to B, and so that you could provide for yourself, for your family, so that you can build a life. The second thing the Bible talks about when it talks about building a house is building a family. A lot of families in the Bible were called uh, the house of, of David or the house of, of Jacob, and while this isn't something necessarily we use today, we still use the terminology of households, right? I'm the Jones household, there's the Witt household, uh, the Avetia house, household. We, to build a, a family is also to build a house. And then the third thing the Bible can mean when it's talking about building a house is to build a nation. Uh, there's the, the house of Israel was mentioned in the Bible. Or, or today, when we talk about the White House or, or the House of Representatives, it's not just talking about a specific place. It's talking about the country as a whole, right? Or in, in the United Kingdom, they have the, the House of Parliament or the House of uh, Lords, I think, they have over there. And so to build a house can mean to build a life, to build a family, or to build a nation. And so both of these men here, they were, they were building a house, and so are we. Probably in all three of those categories, right? To, to build a life. We all want something better for ourselves. We all have dreams and goals. Uh, we all have some sort of family relations that we want to make sure are, are going well. And also, I hope, we're all trying to be good citizens of the country. So we're all trying to build a house, and both men were trying to build a house. The second thing both men had in common is that they were both in the same church. They both went to the same church. Now, how do I know they both, both went to the same church? Well, because Jesus says that both men heard these words of mine, so both of the builders heard the words of Jesus. And I think this is important for us this morning because I think this kind of takes away the notion that one of these builders, you know, was a Christian and one was an atheist or one was churched and one was completely unchurched. Because I think when I read this story, this is something that I, I usually think of. But the fact is both of these builders were sitting in the same sermon, in the same church, if you will, and they both heard the words of Jesus. And so, so far, we, we both fit into both of these categories, right? We all have dreams, and currently, right now, we're all sitting in the same church. And the third thing these, these men had in common is that both builders got hit by a storm. Both builders got hit by a storm. And so in the Bible, uh, just like building a house, uh, to encounter a storm can also have a, a different meaning. 
Uh, to, encounter, or to encounter a storm can mean to undergo some sort of hardship in life or, or some sort of trial or, or just a, a, very, a time that's, that's not going well for you. Right? And I'm sure that many of us in here can relate this morning, that many of us might be right in the middle of a storm right now. I don't know who, uh, who once said this, but uh, there's a saying that says, everyone in life is either in the middle of a storm, just coming out of a storm, or about to go into a storm. And like I said, I'm sure many of us can relate this morning. You know, I wish I could say that if you follow Jesus, you won't encounter any storms at all, <laughs> but that's clearly not what the Bible teaches. Because both of these men heard the words of Jesus, and yet both of these men went into a storm. And so that's pretty much the end of the, end of the difference, or end of the similarities right there. Right? Because Jesus calls one of these builders wise, and the other one he calls a fool. And so this tells us right away that you can be a wise person with a dream, or you can be a foolish person with a dream. Right? Or you can be a, a wise person in church, or you can be a fool in church. You can be a wise person who encounters difficulties and hardships in life, or you can be a foolish person who, inter- who uh, undergoes hardships and, and trials and difficulties in life. And so I think we need to take a step back just for a second and talk about what does the Bible mean by the wise man and the foolish man. And so in, in the Bible, wisdom isn't necessarily uh, talking about how much you know. It's not talking about how much head knowledge you have or, or uh, what your GPA was in high school or college or how many random facts you know from the encyclopedia. Wisdom in the Bible is talking about people who take the words of the Bible and actually live by those words. People who know the truth about God and actually live it out. That's the wise person. Uh, the foolish person in the Bible, on the, on the other side of things, isn't the person you know, who had to re- repeat kindergarten 15 times. It's not the person who never graduated from any school or the person who, who just you know, doesn't do very well when they're watching Jeopardy on TV. That's not what it means to be a fool. To be, to be a fool in the Bible is talking about the person who knows the words of Jesus and doesn't live by the words of Jesus. That's a foolish person. And on, on a side note, this is why it's important for those of you who are in school or those of you who, who like to watch the media to make sure that what you're taking in, you're taking it in through the lenses of the Bible. So when you're studying math or science or history or while you're watching the news, you're watching all of that and you're evaluating it through the lenses of what the Bible says instead of looking at the, lenses, or instead of looking at the Bible through the lenses of what you've learned. Does that make sense? Because if you don't do that, then the Bible says that you're a fool. And you know what the Greek word for fool is? It's moron. I didn't make that up. That's really what it is. It's, it's moron. So Jesus is saying that there was a wise builder who built his house on the rock And he's basically saying that the moron (laughs) built his house on the sand. And so that's the second difference right there, that one of them built their house on the rock and one built their house on the sand. So foundations are really important, right? I mean, uh, my brother, he's eight years old, and he's uh, what you would call a a Lego master. Uh, He can can take Lego pieces and, and build just these crazy creations without even following the instructions. And I think he built a boat or a plane or something and threw it, and it didn't even break. (laughs) Like, I thought when you throw Legos, Lego creations, they're supposed to explode everywhere, but his didn't, his didn't break. I guess he's that good. But as good as he is with Legos, or as good as anyone else might be with Legos, you're not going to build a skyscraper in Dallas or in Fort Worth with a Lego foundation, right? Because the foundation is the most important part of the building. And uh, you're going to have to forgive me if this isn't true, because I'm not a carpenter, or I don't do a lot with buildings, but, but I was reading this week that the higher the building goes the deeper the foundation has to go as well. And that makes sense because, you know, you wouldn't build a skyscraper or any sort of building with the foundation of of a doghouse, right? The foundation is important. But again, Jesus here, he's not just talking about uh, architectural diligence, right? He has some other meaning when he's talking about building a foundation. And I think the key to the whole thing is here in verse 24, where it says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. You see, a a rock foundation or a solid foundation or a foundation that will last is a foundation that's built on the rock of Jesus Christ. It's not any other kind of foundation. And uh, James 1.22, he kind of repeats the same thing in James. He says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Listen to me, the Bible 
The Bible is not just a, God didn't just give us the Bible as a, a, a book of, you know, gentle suggestions on how we can live a good life. The Bible is not the, the best way to build a solid foundation. The Bible is the only way that we can build a solid foundation. And it's only when we build the, our foundation on what the Bible is saying on the rock of Jesus Christ, that's the only time that we're building a solid foundation. And if we don't, if we like to, you know, take a little bit of what the Bible says and take, take pieces out, take the pieces out that we disagree with, the pieces that intrude on our life, the, the pieces that we, we read in the Bible and we're not necessarily fans of, if we like to disregard all that, then what we're trying to do is we're trying to build our house on a mixture of sand and rock, and that won't work. So I'm allergic to bananas. All right, I know that's probably a really weird allergy. Um, now you know, if you know if you ever need to take me out or something, you can cook me a dish with bananas in it, and I'll, I won't last. <laughs> I don't know why I told you that, because now if I'm on anyone's bad side, that's not a good thing to say. But I'm allergic to bananas, and bananas are very nutritional, and they're very healthy, and uh, I guess, I don't know what they do. Amanda probably knows. They help with cramps and all kinds of other stuff. I don't know. So I wish I was not allergic to bananas because they're very good for you. But another time that I wish I wasn't allergic to bananas is when I see pictures of banana splits. Banana splits just look like the best thing in the world. <laughs> Maybe it's because they have all the colors of the rainbow in there. They have, they have the, the, the banana down there at the bottom. And then, you know, they have a couple scoops of ice cream on top. And then there's some chocolate that's on top. And then there's some sprinkles. There's sprinkles on banana splits. I don't eat them, so I wouldn't know, but it sounds good. Uh, there, there's whipped cream on the banana split, and then there's like a little fake cherry <laughs> that is, has no nutritional value that sits on the top of the banana split, and it just looks absolutely amazing. Now, that banana has so much nutritional value, however, that's canceled out by all the unnutritional stuff that you put on top of it, right? Like, I mean, if I just ate one banana split, I'm not just going to drop dead. Well, actually, I'm allergic to bananas, so I probably would drop that. But, but if you guys, if you ate one banana split, you're not just going to die right away. Um, but, but if you built the foundation of your food diet on banana splits, you're not going to last very long, right? So many people in our society today, they want to take the word of God, they want to take the Bible, and they want to put a little bit of what's popular on top of it. They want, they want to sprinkle some of what the world says and what the media says and what social media says. And what they're doing right there is, is they're putting, they're, they're, they're mixing sand and they're mixing the rock and that won't work. Because the word and the world cannot coexist. It's just not possible. Galatians 1.10 says, uh, am, I now, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. See, you can't do both. They don't mix. Now, this doesn't mean you can't ever hang out with non-believing friends, or you can never listen to music that's not Christian music, or you can never watch movies that are above a certain rating. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that your foundation, what your primary intake is, has to be built on the word of Jesus Christ. Uh, Tony Evans, who's a pastor in Dallas, he says, he has this quote, and it's just great. He says, one of the reasons the word does not work in many people's lives is it gets canceled out by a secular inclusion that contradicts God's authority. One of the reasons the word does not work in so many people's lives is it gets canceled out by a secular inclusion that contradicts God's authority. So both of these men, they had dreams. They were building a house. Uh, both went to the same church. Uh, both got hit by storms. Uh, but Jesus says one was wise and one was a fool. And one built his house on the rock and the other built his house on the sand. Now before we get to the final difference, it's worth noting that up until this point, externally, both of these men might have looked pretty similar. Right? I mean, uh, I know Jesus called one wise and one, a fool, one was a fool, but nothing had happened yet. And they both looked pretty much the same. And in fact, and the Bible doesn't tell us this, but I have to wonder if the one who built his house on the sand actually looked better externally so far. Because to build your house on the rock takes a lot more time and a lot more energy. You have to dig deeper to build your house into a rocky foundation than the sand. And so the person who built his house on the sand was probably done a little bit sooner. He could go out and you know, hang out with his friends or work more and make more money and give off the impression 
that everything was going, going all right. But look at what it says in, in verse 27. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. See, when the storm hit, only the rock, only the house that was built on the rock remained standing. See, it's, it's in times of testing, it's in times of hardships where we see where our foundation really lies. You know, it's easy to, to raise your hand in worship and, and sing, you know, I have 10,000 reasons for my heart to, to um, I don't know what it says, 10,000 reasons for my heart to praise God or whatever that song says, right? It's easy to sing about that when everything's going good, when your bank account's full or when, you're, when your entire family's healthy, when you have the job of your dreams or the, or the spouse of your dreams or you have great kids and everything just seems to be going all right. You, you know, you might not even be saying, I have 10,000 reasons, maybe I have a million reasons. A million reasons for my heart to praise God. But what happens when you're hanging out with your friends or your family and you get a phone call? And it's from the doctor's, a doctor's visit that you went on several weeks ago, maybe even forgot about, and he says your test results are in and it's not looking good. What happens when that job brings you in for a meeting and they, says, and they say, you know, due to, due to matters outside of our control, we're going to have to let you go? What happens when uh, your, your health starts to fail? Or when you check your bank account and, you know, all those zeros that you thought were in your bank account are on the wrong side of the, de the decimal point. What happens when you lose your best friend in the entire world for good? What happens when the storms of life hit? You see, it's only when the storms of life hit that you see where your foundation really lies. And where your foundation lies will determine if you make it through the storm. Uh, there was a book by uh, a guy named Steve Ferrara. I totally destroyed his last name. Uh, but it's called Standing Tall. And in this book, he talks about Hurricane Matthew. Uh, Hurricane Matthew hit Florida, I don't know how many years ago, but just like a lot of other hurricanes, it was completely devastating, took out entire neighborhoods, houses uh, crashed to the ground, trees ripped out of the earth. It, it was terrible. And so the news camera crew goes out to Florida and they're going through the neighborhoods and they see one single house still standing. And there's a man in the front yard and this man is clearing up some of the debris that had blown into his yard, even though his house was fine. And so the cameraman and the camera crew, they go up to him trying to figure out, you know, how is this, how is this man's house still standing? And so they asked him, they said, sir, why is your house the only one in the entire neighborhood that's still standing? How did you manage to escape the severe damage of the hurricane? I built this house myself, the man said. And I also built it according to Florida State Building Code. That's the state of Florida, not the college. He said, when the code called for two by six trusses, I used two by six trusses. I was told that a house built by code could withstand a hurricane. I did, and it did. I suppose I was the only one who followed the code. See, it's when the storms of life hit that you see where your foundation really lies. And where your foundation lies will determine if you make it through the storm. So today's New Year's Day, 2017. Now, I'm not the best with math, but if I did my math correctly, that means that yesterday was New Year's Eve, 2016. Am I doing well so far? Okay. okay. Let me take it up another level. That means two years ago from yesterday was New Year's Eve 2014. I really hope I did that right, or else that's embarrassing. <laughs> but two years ago from yesterday, uh, my family, we were all uh, together again, and we were up in a, a cabin in the woods up in southern Ohio, and it was a snowy day. It was, it was actually uh, pretty interesting because the, the uh, fireplace in that cabin didn't work, and so we had to open the oven to kind of heat the whole cabin. So that was kind of an interesting scenario there. Uh, but so my whole family, we were in this cabin, and we were playing all sorts of games and just talking and having a great time. Even though it was freezing outside, it was nice and, and cozy in that cabin. And so we were in the middle of some sort of game, and so my dad, he looked at all of us, and he said, I want everyone just to, to take a second and just think about how this is right here. Remember, this is New Year's Eve 2014. And he said, because New Year's Eve 2015 isn't promised. And none of us knew at the time, 
But the very next day, New Year's Day of 2015, my dad was rushed to the hospital. And he underwent all sorts of procedures and, and medications and, and all sorts of things that culminated this past summer with open heart surgery. And we didn't know that was going to happen when we were all together on that New Year's Eve. And thankfully, my dad, uh, he, he was able to make it through that storm and make it through that trial. But that's not guaranteed. Right? We're not guaranteed to always. And in fact, not only are we not guaranteed to make it to 2018 New Year's, but we're not guaranteed to make it to, to January 2nd of 2017. And I don't want to say that just to be all morbid or to be all, you know, maybe you're paranoid of, of certain things. I didn't want to say that to increase your paranoia. I just want to say that because that's actually true. And when the storms of life hit, not if, but when, the only way that we're going to make it through those storms is if our life is built on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Everything else is sand. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell with a great crash. And then it seems Jesus just walks off. I mean, the, the final words of the greatest sermon ever preached are with a great crash. The only thing that Jesus leaves ringing in the people's ears are it fell with a great crash. He doesn't try and, you know, bring the worship team up and, and have, sing one final song. I guess that would have been the 12 disciples and sing one final song. All he says basically is, if you don't listen to me, your house is going to collapse with a great crash. And then he basically just mic drops and is gone. And so I thought about doing the same thing this morning, but I'm not Jesus. And it would just be really awkward because I don't have a handheld mic. But I do want to do something a little bit different this morning. Because you see, today is New Year's, New Year's Day. And there's no better day to, than today to make sure that your house is built on the rock. Because you see, a lot of people today are trying to make sure that everything's all right with quick fix solutions, like New Year's resolutions. And there's nothing wrong with New Year's resolutions because New Year's resolutions are usually based on things that should be fixed anyway. But the problem isn't on what's going on externally. The problem is internal, and we have to get all the way down to the foundation. Or else we're just trying to do quick fixes like my dad and my brother and I, just trying to patch up that hole in the wall when the real problem was the foundation. And the only way that we can fix what's going on inside is by the help of the Holy Spirit and with the help of God. And so what I want us to do for, for the short remainder of time that we have left is I want us to pray. I want us to pray. And I want us to pray about four things specifically. First, I want you to pray about your own foundation. Because maybe you've been sitting here this morning and you realize, maybe, I'm not, maybe my life is not being built on the rock of Jesus Christ. Maybe, maybe I'm trying to do some weird mixture of sand and rock and it's not working out for me. Or maybe you're not currently in the middle of a trial, but you know that when those storms might hit, you're not ready. And so I want you to pray for your own foundation and that God will change your heart to be more aligned with his heart because he's the only one that can make that happen. Second thing I want us to do is I want us to pray for our family. Uh, the book of Mark says that a house that's divided cannot stand. And so I want, I want us to pray for our families' houses, our households, that we will build our house on the rock of Jesus Christ. The third thing I want us to pray for is our country. Because unless you've been living under a rock for the last year, then you know last year was an election year. And so that comes with all sorts of, you know, hostility and divisiveness from all, all angles of the political spectrum. And however, nothing's too broken for Jesus to fix, right? And so I want us to pray that our country will continue or will, will build its, will build, that our country will want to build on the solid foundation of Jesus Christ. And then the final thing I want us to pray for is our church. Uh, and in just a couple weeks, Jared's going to start a sermon called The One. I'm really excited for it, and he's going he's gonna to talk about doing what we need to do as a church. And so I want us to pray and see if, if our church is built on the sandy foundations of comfort, 
or if we're really willing to do whatever it takes to build our house on the rock of Jesus and do what he commands. All right, so Will's going to come up here, and he's going to lead us, uh, or he's just going to play a few songs, just instrumentally at first. And then he's going to lead us in one final song at the end. And what I want us to do now is I just want us to pray. Because there's no better way to build 2017 than starting off in prayer. And so if you're most comfortable just sitting in the pews, that's fine. I don't want this to be a time just to, you know, sit there and, and count the colors on the stained glass window or something. But if you're most comfortable sitting in the pews, that's fine. But there's going to be people in the back who are willing to pray for you. Or if you want to come up here and pray, or if you just want to find your own place in this sanctuary and pray, we're just going to pray for about six or seven minutes. Not each, but just all together. And we really want to pray and make sure that we as a church and we as ourselves and our families and our country are starting this year off the right way and building our house on the solid foundation of Jesus Christ. So I'll pray real quick, uh, and then we'll start by praying for the first one, which is our own foundation. God, thank you again for this morning. Thank you for the privilege where we can come here and, and hear your word taught without fear of anyone busting through the doors, but we can come here and worship you freely. Help us not to take that for granted this morning as we, as we pray. Help us to really uh, dig into the Holy Spirit this morning and, and, and really leave here changed. Because it's only through prayer, it's only through you that we can build a solid foundation for 2017. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Let's start by praying with the first one, which is your own foundation. <clears throat> 